Good evening and welcome to the first ever I'm in View podcast with myself, Liam Innes, my co-host Jake Pointer. Hello. And expert panellist Thomas Fro. Hello. Owen Innes. Hello. And Mr Stephen Povey. Hello there. We are delighted to say that we are bringing you this first episode in association with After Extra Time Shirts. So just follow at A-E-T Shirts, all one word, on Twitter for some class content and merchandise. Coming up tonight, we will review Livingston's January so far. We'll look ahead to our massive game on Sunday against St Mirren in the League Cup semi-final by sharing our favourite Livingston semi-final moments. We'll also be talking all things League Cup with CIS Cup 2004 legend Sir Derek Lilly in the first of our ex-player interviews. So get comfortable, grab yourselves a tin and strap yourselves in for some excellent Livingston FC based content with us at the Am and View podcast. Well, 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 2020 is finally over and the Amber Machine have been on some run, am I right? With wins against Ross County and Hibs and a stalemate at Celtic Park, this has shown that the Martindale juggernaut continues. The boys have chosen a moment each so far in January to look at that has made their month so far even better. So Owen, what is your moment of January so far? Um, Probably Scott Robinson. Just in general, uh, showing that he is just an absolute player. Uh, he uh, His goals against Kilmarnock, his goal uh, against uh, Hibs, uh, just, he's just been absolutely phenomenal um, for a player who grew up as a, um, as a midfielder, essentially as a central midfielder, attacking midfielder, to be playing up front and doing so, so well for us uh, over, the, over the past few matches. We always knew that he could do it, but he's he's just showing now um, what an asset he is to this club. Um, the fact that we've signed him from East Fife as well. Um, but yeah, absolutely brilliant. So my highlight from January so far has definitely been Scott Robinson's uh, rise to being one of uh, Livingston's best strikers. Yeah. See, like, I always liked Robinson as a midfielder. I thought when he played up top, he would do a lot of running, he would give a lot of energy in that, but his composure in front of goal the past couple of seasons has been so bad at times but aye, this season it's just been amazing seeing the transition in him from like obviously he was a utility player before because we would play him up top, but actually now he is a number nine, as well as a centre mid as well I think. Definitely, I think uh, Robinson up front is is good. I think, uh, um, I, I still think his decision making could be a little bit better at times, especially at Celtic Park um, when he had the option of playing. Um, I think it was uh, Josh Mullen. He had the option of playing Josh Mullen through, uh, and instead took a shot. Went for the spectacular. It didn't work, obviously, and the, the result at the end of the day was still a good result for us. Um, so I think sometimes his decision making, his composure, like you said. Um, has got a lot better now because I think he's starting to settle into a striker's role. Um, but uh, but now nah, I think he's I, I just what a player he is. Um, so intelligent. So yeah, brilliant. Povey, some his finishing has been a bit dykesy. You know, um, I think he's certainly picked up some tips from him from last season. All those wee lobs over the keeper, amazing. Aye, it's mad that. Like the, the goal against Kilmarnock, you were like, it wasn't lucky, obviously. He knew what he was doing. But the fact that he was able to do it like two weeks later against Ross County as well was just mental. Like, pretty much not, not the same position or anything. It was, a, it was a different goal, obviously. But yeah, to have that sort of awareness. Whereas before, I think he would have tried to take a touch and then just sort of blast it as hard as he could. But aye, he's learning these wee sort of tricks as a as a proper number nine now. Uh, well, we've got you there, Povey. What was your moment of the month so far? Uh, yeah, so far, I know. Uh, so many highlights. I mean, still for me, that Easter Road 3 now. It just, coming about going to Easter Road, I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. And uh, the 
remind, it remind me of all those years ago uh, back when we finished third and we beat them 3-0 almost an identical game and yeah, just wish we'd been there lads to be honest uh, I love going to Easter and, I, and uh, yeah what a game and really kicked off the year so hopefully long may it continue uh, It's pretty hard to argue that to be fair Thomas, what about yourself? So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the, the Hibs game and talk about you know one one moment um, and it was Josh Mullins' goal. Uh, I think it it kind of epitomised you know where we've improved and also you know talk, talking about Scott Robinson his his assist to to play him in was fantastic, absolutely fantastic and and you know he's utilising the same sort of techniques that you're seeing in, in his finish but the way that he played him in and then that, that finish as well across the keeper I, I love a goal like that like a, almost like a counter attack fast breaking on breaking down the defence and then the, the way he put it into the bottom corner I think was just absolutely fantastic and it set the tone for the game as well um, we are obviously by far the better team and uh, yeah it was that was my moment of the month there's been a lot of good moments this month but that was my my Goal of the month. Yeah, I mean, M- Mullen, really, what a signing he's been. And, you know, he's brought that in the rest of this month as well. You know, I thought he played, played a blinder at uh, Parkhead, unlucky not to score when he hit the bar. But, my God, it's just it's outstanding. Absolutely brilliant. Great to have him back. And, you know, I, I think uh, Martindale, I thought it was bizarre how Holt never played him when, when we got him back. And, you know, he played, played so well in the cup, but then we didn't play him for ages and we weren't really doing great. And oh, it's so good to have him back, you know. And you know, he's definitely, he's been man of the match in most of our games. Outstanding. Yeah, ah, he's been so consistent since he's come back. Like, I think when we had him in the championship, obviously he was brilliant. Uh, like, he sort of, that was when he sort of really became the assist king. Was that playoff year in the championship? But there was still something, just not, not, not there was wasn't something not right about it. But there was just something you felt like there was something missing. But this year he just seems to be a complete player. Like, uh, and I since he's come back, I mean, yeah, he's pretty much at the forefront of everything that we're doing at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Jake, what about your moment of the month so far? Uh, so mine's kind of a few collective moments is uh, a David Martindale after match talk. You know, <laughs> anything he's done from the media. I absolutely love that man. Like I never thought realised how much I loved him until now. The guy just so much passion, loves the club, knows exactly what he wants to do. And you know, you see passionate people and they make it you believe what they believe. And that's you can tell the team all believe it and I guarantee, you know, he's pit my Scottish football for me, right? Because I think all of us have had a football coach like Davy Martindale. You know, that's why it's some Raj screaming <laughs> at, you know, you're about 10 years old and you're getting again screamed at by some football coach. And that's how we were brought up. And that's just what he kind of reminds me of. It's almost nostalgic, but, you know, so honest in interviews as well. You know, how much do you see that whole with his cliches? So over that, Martindale talking about specifics of the game being so honest. I think, you know, he's a bit rough around the edges, but you know, that's just again, that's almost Livingston in a, in a nutshell. And that's why, you know, that's why this club's amazing, to be honest. Yeah, Owen? I completely and utterly agree with you. I think uh, David Martindale is just um he's he's just he knows what he's talking about. Um and like people will slag him all they want for the fact that like you know, he never played any kind of major level of, of football, like certainly not first team football and stuff like that. Um, you know, but, you know, Mourinho and stuff like that, they, they weren't necessarily great players, but are they're able to work out how the game should be played and how and how it's played well. Um, and also another thing as well, you see a lot of slagging of uh, Martin Dale for just for his accent. It's like, who gives a fuck about your accent? You know, you're. It, he's a good manager. Who cares? And uh, yeah, David Martindale, top man. I think he's uh, definitely been um, a major. Uh, he's played a major part in the club over the last few seasons. And uh, yeah, uh, brilliant, Thomas. 
I think I think you're starting to see everyone kind of turn around because obviously there's the story behind Daly and, and you know the club haven't shied away from that, which I think is amazing and I think yeah. is the, like 100% the right way to approach the whole situation. But I've started to see a few tweets and things from people in the media who who love interviewing him and love yeah. going to speak to him because of his honesty. Now I've heard I've heard some stories about yeah how he, he when he's nervous and and he and he's very nervous doing these this media thing that he's been forced to do now um, and that's when he starts you know cracking out the jokes but I, I, it's been brilliant value I'm even seeing people from other clubs you know commenting on Twitter things like that about how much they appreciate you know he's like a breath of fresh air totally. to, to Scottish football um, you know so yeah brilliant I, I think my favourite part was no other manager would say what he said about Effie Ambrose the other day <laughs> saying that oh, Neil Lennon's obviously texted him and told him not to score like that's the sort of pish that, like, like Gary Holt, brilliant manager in that. But say if he had that chance against a team like Ross County or or even Celtic, and it was nil nil, we had a chance to win it. Gary Holt would just come out and say the sort of same. It's not just him; the just same managerial pattern that just goes around. Yeah. Oh, you know, we were unlucky. Oh. You know, we didn't get the breaks and stuff like that. But it's I like Jake said as well that he's going into like so much detail how he's setting up the team. Like after the game's been played and the reason he's made subs, like uh so my moment uh for January so far was the subs that he made against Ross County, because I remember messaging the group chat saying, What the hell is he up to? Like he's just swapping players like for like. There's no sort of he doesn't really seem to be changing anything. But then I realised there's nothing needs changed. Like these players are just coming on because they're able to just give that extra, like ten percent that these tired. Like we've got so many games in January. We've got a massive game coming up. Two games of back to back against Celtic. So I, my moment was especially uh, Jack Hamilton because Robo looked raging when he came off against Ross County. I uh, <laughs> kicked the ball into the stand and that, and I thought, right. Jack Hamilton's really got to sort of step up here. Um, and then I him coming back, he's five and getting a goal. His first home, uh, his first game back from his five home loan is just like, that's, just shows you, again, the depth that we've got. That a player like Jack Hamilton can come on and score a goal, like decisive goal in a game against a team that previously, obviously we haven't lost against them for a while, but... Um, you know, under Holt's management, we probably would have struggled in that game against Ross County. But the fact that we were able to bring on Jack Hamilton and score, like for him to get a goal and a and a win at home, that's routine, and that's what we need to get back to. Yeah, Toby. I, uh, I bang on, and I mean, I told you how good is Jet. What a brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> I'll take the rip in because I, I definitely I've been giving Jet a hard time and. Uh, well, he, he started that attack, didn't he, for the, uh, to put us back in front. So, fair play. Well played, Jet. I'll give you that. He made it to, uh, <laughs> he, he made it to um, Soccer AM as well. Uh, that little skill, it was the, the closing for, uh, closing section on Showboats. It was oh, uh, Big Jet. Yeah, no yeah it, was, it was great. It was absolutely brilliant. Now this is something I never thought I would ever say, but here on the Amund View podcast, we're thrilled to say that we are now joined by living Livingston legend. He's the rootin', tootin', goal-scoring son of a gun. He's the Livy fans' dream number sweet 16. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first ever guest, Mr. Derek Lilly. Woo! Whoa! How are you, Derek? Good to be on, guys. I... I... That's the, that's the best introduction I've ever, I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it took it. It genuinely took me about three hours to write it, man. I was like, I don't know what to say. Um, so we'll just dive in straight with uh, your career. So you started your career with Greenock Morton, and after an impressive 57 goals in 180 games for the Ton, you were picked up by Leeds United in the English Premiership. What was it like going from Capolo? to the glitz and glamour of the English Premiership? Uh, I didn't see a big difference initially. 
<laughs> no, it was, it was, it was bizarre. It was, it was bizarre. I mean, uh, so put it into some context, you know what I mean? Uh, I, tell, I mean, the car, I, I mean, I had a club car at Morton. I was very fortunate. Morton did look after me. It was a good club. And it was a Peugeot 106, right? So it was a great wee car, perfect for what I needed. Uh, I mean, I went, when I went down to Ellen Road, uh, or the training ground, as you say, when I first went in, one of the first guys I actually met was Tony DeRigo, who was an England international, uh, who came out of his Porsche 911. Uh, <laughs> And then that was closely followed by Callum Palmer and his uh, chauffeur-driven Mercedes. <laughs> so uh, it was it was a massive cultural change, you know. And it took took me a long time just to get my head round it. I felt as if I was playing football in a a, a Panini album, you know, with all the names that were coming in. It was, uh, it, was it was it was it was fantastic, you know. It was like, it was a dream come true. How how old were you when you went to Leeds, by the way? Like because you were at Morton for quite. Like a spell before you went down, so were you sort of like still early in your career, but was it a bit later than what you would have hoped? If you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, I, I was, I was first three years at Morton, I was semi-professional, so because I was, I was serving my time as a welder uh, in Babcock's and Renfrew, so I didn't actually go professional until I was twenty, uh, and then that was the three right. years I went full time at Morton. So I'd been at Morton sort of six years uh, before I get the move. But I'd only been three years full time, so for me it was, you know, it came quickly. I mean, I, you, you don't. Everybody wants to be successful and they want to do well in football. You just don't know what's going to happen. You know, you really don't. Uh, you need a lot of things to go your way. You know, and uh, and I was fortunate. Three years of really hard work and, uh, and the, the chance came along. So I was twenty three when I made the move, which people say a young guy from Scotland are expecting somebody to be maybe. 19, 20, 21. But I was probably a wee bit older and a wee bit more mature, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But uh, but still a young guy, so it was, it was great. So your time at Leeds seen you team up with a former Morton legend and future Livingston icon, David Hopkin. Did David sort of take you under his wing at all, like settle you down? Because obviously they had that capital connection. Yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, uh, I was we're very fortunate. Obviously the manager was Scottish, George Graham. Uh, and bizarrely, I nearly signed for mm. Crystal Palace, which Davey was at before I signed for Leeds. It was between Leeds and Crystal Palace, so I was going to meet him one way or the other. And uh, but yeah, and so I, <laughs> I, I'd signed in the March. David signed in uh, in the summer time, but also David Robertson had signed from Rangers as well. Uh, so there was a few Scottish guys there, which was brilliant. And, and turns out, you know, I bought. I was because I was there earlier. I bought a house first, and then David Hopkin actually actually moved around the corner for me. Uh, and a, and, a, and a bigger house, I'd, I must add, <laughs> it was round the corner for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so it was great, you know. I mean, obviously we knew each other, uh, and, and my wife got to know his wife and the, and the kids and all that. And there were similar ages in the kids, and all. I mean, so it was just nice to hear Scottish voices and friendly faces. So it did, did help you settle in. So after a couple of loan spells, you went on loan to Hearts and Bury, and then a small. Uh, stint with Oxford United you decided to make a permanent switch back up to Scotland with Dundee United was there any offers to stay down south or were you sort of dead set on coming back to the motherland? I was always going to come home the, the, the circumstances that, uh, that that led to me leaving Oxford were a bit bizarre to be honest with you because the story has been me and my family were, were actually robbed in America at gunpoint in the summer time uh, so you know, after that, I went back to Oxford and we couldn't settle on the family. Uh, so that was, so I literally sat with my wife one night and just says, I can't do this anymore. Because uh, I was doing a lot of travelling. We're trying to move down from Leeds. Oxford had about four or five managers and it was just constant change. And, and But I just tried, you know, about five or six months since since an incident in America, I tried to continue and I just, I literally just thought I can't do this anymore. And I told the club and basically I had a frank conversation with Joe Kinnear who came in as director of football and just says, look, you know, I can't, and they understood. They were very good, don't get me wrong. I, I'd imagine what happened is they must have started phoning around because I says, look, I'm going home. These guys do what you want. I'm going back up to Scotland. So they must have then, I, I assume, phoned around a lot of clubs and, and thankfully Alex Smith remembered me uh, playing against Clyde and whatever it is so you'll get a chance to go up and go on trial at uh, Dundee United and you know manage to secure a contract so I was very fortunate but you know if I'd landed at Stenhouse Muir or 
I'll, whenever I'd landed, I'd have been quite happy because at that point it was just a case of her coming home. So, just touching on your time at Dundee United, uh, you enjoyed a fairly successful time there. Um, and you're probably most remembered for scoring a pivotal goal to keep them up on the second last day of the season against St Johnston in a Tayside derby. Would you say that was probably your best moment for them? Yeah, probably. I would say so. Uh, mm. You know, that six months assigned, I think, just at the end of December, July, uh, Christmas time, you know, going into the next new year. So we finished the season. We bought them in the league when I signed. Uh, they changed. They're bringing in a lot of new players. But that sort of five, six months period was brilliant. And, you know, to get to the second last game of the season, you know, to beat St Johnston, you know, after being 2 0 down at half time and, and me scoring the winner was just, you know, it's got an iconic picture and there's an iconic place in the Dundee United Day sort of history, so to speak. So it was, it was brilliant. It was great. Two years after that, I mean, I loved the club, had my ups and downs, you know, as, as strikers do, I suppose. But uh, a great, great time. But that was a, you know, to have that sort of moment was, was special. You know, with Almondville, sorry, Almondville, uh, McDermott Park was basically full of Dundee United fans. <laughs> uh, I seen the highlights on YouTube and it looked fucking mental. Like, the uh, like fans like just sprinting <laughs> on the pitch for the last minute and that looked wild. Like, um, yeah, it was it was it was quite hard. It's quite hard to you know get your head around it because we were uh, obviously you go you go out of the game, you start the game, the game kicking off, but you're looking around the stadium and there's basically three three sides of the stadium are full of Dundee United fans, and uh, and we we had a poor first half. Charlie Miller missed a penalty. You know we huffed and puffed and. Uh, and, and funny enough, my dad was at the game. He took my son, young Derek, who was only a kid, I don't know, five or six. And the abuse that was getting shouted, my dad actually left at half time, just oh couldn't God. stand it anymore. So he left oh, and sat and no listened way. to the game in the car. And, uh, and, uh, and then literally, obviously, the chap. Charlie get uh, saying Charlie gets Charlie get a bad tackle and Paul Hartley gets sent off and then you know we scored three. I set up the first cross into the first goal uh, for I think it was Charlie. We Craig Easton scored the second and you know it seemed the last kick of the ball for me and it was just pandemonium when the goal went in. <laughs> All right, uh, so we're going to move on to your uh, your Livingston career now. So um, so after he left United, uh, he decided to make obviously the greatest career choice ever by joining uh, Marcio Maximo's foot stalling dream, the Amber Machine. <laughs> uh, what was it brought you to Livingston? <laughs> Bizarre set of circumstances. Again, football's got a funny way of doing things. Uh, so I had actually, I'd been released from my Dundee United contract, so I had no club the first time in my career. I had no club in the summer. You know, you're, you're pretty sure you'll get something, but the phone's very quiet. And uh, the only offer I had was Partick Thistle. Uh, and Jerry Collins had been speaking to, I think at my agent at the time, was Raymond Sparks, and we had a sort of deal on the table. And, and basically Livingston came in and matched the, the deal. But, but basically the way the deal worked, I was getting paid more basic pay than and, and less appearance money. So for me, I thought, well, that's better for me. So, And actually, and to get a chance to work at Levy, I thought, I thought Levy have got a better chance of staying up than Partick Thistle. You know, I thought it's a better team to go to, better set up. So, uh, so it was kind of by default I ended up at Livingston. Uh, but, you know, I knew a lot of the players there and, and, and I hadn't actually played at Almondville, but I knew a lot of players. So I was, I was really looking forward to it. I thought it was an opportunity that came along that I was uh, had to pinch myself because I was 31, I think, at the time. And you think, what's a, what, what, what opportunities are going to come along? So I felt very fortunate. Despite an OK start to the season, uh, Marcelo Maximo um, left the manager position and uh, David Hay took over. Was there a kind of a sense of relief when David took over and, you know, from his unorthodox techniques of on his tennis ball football training and things like that? Uh, oh, Maximo, what a guy, yeah. Uh, apparently, apparently coach Ronaldo, but I think he <laughs> carried the water for the under-12 team in Brazil or something like that. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a strange set of affairs <laughs> because... Uh, it was, Jim, it was Jim Leishman that actually signed me. Jim Leishman, was, obviously, he was there and he signed me. And Maximo sort of got announced as a manager. And it was one of those ones everybody's thinking, who is this guy? And, uh, yeah, we're, we're out doing training with no footballs, you know, doing bits of work with no footballs. And, you know, he kept calling me, and I don't know if, if you know this, he called me Alan for months. All the time he was there, he called me Alan. So, uh, <laughs> just kind of... <laughs> 
<laughs> I just had to get on with it, you know. It just became a bit of a, a, a bit of a kind of a joke, and he just called me Alan. I ended up answering to it. I just yeah, whatever. Uh, so, uh, but but I'd, 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 uh, the team hadn't started too great. Uh, first game of the season, I played Patrick Thistle. I was suspended from the from Dundee United, so I didn't play in it. But apparently, David Hay went down at half time because the team were all over the place, and he wasn't too happy. And then. It was only a matter of time, I think. He was getting sort of found out, you know. It was the team was sort of just all over the place, and uh, as soon as David Hay stepped in, everybody thought, "Thank God for that," you know. It was like, yeah, and it was, it was, you feel sorry for the guy, you know. He was out his depth, you know, but he'd been offered the job, and he took it, he took the job. But David came in, was it just gave everybody a lift, and you know, uh, I think you know after that, I think we went. I think the first game we beat Hibs. Uh, and I got a start. It's the first time I'd started. Maximo wouldn't wouldn't pick me. He was playing everybody else but me. Did you not score two goals in that uh, in David Hayes' debut? Yeah, for Hibs, I did. Yeah, it was. Uh, I scored two. That's right. Uh, I sorry, I couldn't hear your voice there. Uh, I, I scored scored two goals, which was because I'd, I'd scored against uh, I'd scored against Celtic at Celtic Park. We get beat five one. I came on and scored, and I'd scored against Motherwell. Came on as a sub and scored with one one nil. Uh, and this was when Maximo was the manager and Alan Preston sat in the dugout one day and he was kind of saying, well, you're going to have to start this guy. So David came in, gave me a start, me and, uh, and I scored two goals in my first game. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was brilliant. You know, for me, I, I was actually playing really well. I was just doing doing what I do, working hard and, you mm. know, the goals were coming. It was great. So just before the semi-final against uh, Dundee, it was announced that we were going into administration. Um, obviously, when you scored, what was the feeling? Um, obviously, on the park at the time, and then uh, afterwards, uh, especially knowing that some of your colleagues were unfortunately about to lose their jobs. You know, when we scored the goal, everybody just there was a lot of emotion. But in the dressing room after it, for all we were happy. It was, you know, it was a, a kind of subdued happiness. And in the next few days, you know, we're, we're just trying to help each other through. And I, I think, unfortunately, David, the, the task of Having to let go only a few players because we didn't have a big squad. We didn't have massive overheads. There wasn't a huge sort of background staff. There wasn't really many people you could cut loose. And it was sadly that it fell to a few players. One of the biggest ones was a guy, Kino, uh, the midfielder. Uh, he was a top, top guy, brilliant player. And only through injury, he, that's why he wasn't in the team. So he'd sort of missed out through injury. And there was Kino, uh, there was another Spanish boy left footed player, I can't remember his name, but uh, they two were let go. Grief, uh, number 88, I think everybody was glad to see the back of him. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and there was a, who was it? We, we signed a striker from, uh, who was it, Gia Pua? We signed a striker from Scunthorpe, apparently he played for Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid. Oh, Gia poor, I mean, my God, what a bad player. Uh, so, uh, you know, in training, it was so funny with Gia. We, we used to physically shout, get get him on his left foot. He couldn't kick a ball with his left foot. And he used to get so frustrated and kick a ball away. Uh, but but uh, all joking aside, I mean, uh, getting back to it, it was, it was sad. One of the one of the, the main abiding memories I take from it was we were actually Britain in tears. He was terrified. Young kid looking to start his way in football and he was in tears. He thought he was going to get let go because he'd come through the Livingston Academy. And, you know, the wee things like that stick in your, your head. But, you know, as a, as a group of players, we stuck together. We were, we, you felt awful for the guys that were getting let go. There's nothing you can do about it. You just physically can't do anything. This is just sort of following up on the sort of administration. Just one last point in it. Um, I remember seeing a rumour somewhere that Dave David Fernandez was paying a player's wage. I think it was a guy, Pasquinelli, Argentinian guy. Was that was so like it was he was paying his wages so he could stay at the club. Yeah, I, that's true. I mean, I, I didn't realise that. Uh, I can't. I think it was Alan Preston at the time. At the time, I was not aware of it. I found that out way way after it happened. You know, probably after I left Livingston, it came out. But. Uh, hmm. Yeah, Fernando Pasquinelli, his, uh, his girlfriend and his wife obviously was over here in Scotland. I think they just had a baby and he was going to get let go. And apparently David stepped in and says, I'll pay his wages. So, and that told you everything you need to know about David. You know, David was a great guy, you know, very generous, obviously. But, you know, just 
you know, to step up and do that, you know, and actions speak louder than words. Right, now, let's go into the main event. Uh, the club obviously had an excellent League Cup run. Um, started out with a win at Queen's Park, uh, then we beat Dundee United and then Aberdeen in the quarterfinals, a game that we won 3-2. We are still opening the scoring, which set up a semi-final tie against Dundee Easter Road. How confident were the players? Obviously, like sort of moving the administration stuff to the side. Like in terms of just the game of football, how confident were the players that they could actually go on and win it? So we were very confident because I think, given when since David uh, Haystack stepped in and took us over, we actually we were confident getting into every game. You know, just the group of players that we had, a lot of experience, a lot of young players, good energy. You know, I don't think we ever went into a game. You're in the worst, even against Old Firm, you know, you always feel you're, you're good enough to get something out of the game. So you're looking at Dundee and probably subconsciously you're thinking to yourself, you've got, a, you know, what a chance to get to a final playing Dundee. But the thing about semi-finals is they're usually pretty awful games because there's so much nerves, you know, nobody wants to give an inch and, you know, no, nobody really wants to take a chance, you know. And, and you know, the game wasn't a great game at mm. Easter Road, but, but yeah, you know, we would have been confident, there's no doubt about that. You know, you look around the dressing room, you look at you know, the players you've got beside you on the pitch and, you know, uh, we, we, we were confident. I mean, I was, I was probably one of the best scoring sort of uh, spells I'd been, I'd been in in my career. So it didn't matter what game I played and I always felt as if I was going to score. So, you know, to have little things like that, you know, you need... You need a moment of genius, a moment of brilliance, so you know a, a mistake or something to just go your way, and you know we get a penalty. So we're very, very confident. It was a poor, poor game, but you know it, when you look back, I mean, it was an absolute stonewall penalty. So we're fortunate we got it, and you know, uh, and I managed to to stick it away. Were you always going to be the penalty taker that day, or did you just <laughs> grab the ball and go, "That this is mine"? I think so. I, I think earlier in the season, uh, I think maybe Lee Mako taking penalties. I can't actually remember how it actually came to me taking the penalties, Aye. but I don't know if Makes had missed any penalties or something like that, and then I started taking them. But yeah, I, I, when I look back at the footage, you know, I can't remember if, who said we were going to take penalties. But obviously, some point during that season, they decided that I was going to take the penalty it, penalties and you know and got that. So there was no else looking back at it. it was, it's not we didn't argue over the ball. No else was looking to take it. It's just the ball got given to me and I was taking the penalty. So, uh, but I don't know how that happened because obviously earlier on, you know, I wasn't featured and there was somebody else was taking penalties. And uh, but uh, I was glad I was glad to take it. You know, I did actually slip taking it, but I managed to stick it in the top corner. <laughs> No, nah, honestly, my heart skipped when I seen you slip. Like, I mean, thinking it was going over, but it was like slow motion. Eh? It was horrible. Yeah, but nah, it was, yeah. oh, what a finish, man. What a night as well. Um, right, so we'll open up to the others for questions. Now, Povey, uh, you're having the most difficulty with sound, so do you want to go first? Make sure it's working. Could you foresee a final uh, at that point? It's, it was commonly said, and I think people have said it after it, you know, players wise. I'm pretty sure it was Alan Preston uh, that said to us at the time, you know, right, we're starting off at Hamden, let's see if we can finish here type thing. So, you know, we had obviously Queen's Park, uh, you know, not not many players get to play at Hamden, you know, because if you've never played at Queen's Park level, then you don't play there unless you get a semi-final or a final. I'd been at Hamden a few times with semi-finals with Dundee United, so, but it was just sort of said in the background, but actually, you know, it's, it's sort of things go on against Dundee United, we'd scored, I think, uh, Stuart Lovell had scored, and I think Willie, Willie Young, the referee, made a bit of a mistake during the game, then you got to Aberdeen, you get a result there, and you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, Hibs, Hibs had a really difficult draw. They went and beat Celtic and, and Rangers to get to the final. But, you know, sometimes the draw just opens up. So I suppose as things were going along, you know, I, th- I think Lee, I think it was Stuart Lovell. He likes a bet. I think he put a bet on us, you know, winning the final or getting to the final or something like that. So I think everybody felt we had a chance of getting there, just the way the draw was panning out. So it was, uh, it was, it was good, you know. So but there was a, it was said whether... Whether anybody believed they were going to get to Hamden at that point playing Queen's Park, I don't really know. But obviously, the way things turned out, you know, it was after a couple of games, you're thinking, yeah, we've got a right good chance here. And on the lead up to Hamden, uh, obviously, you scored the, the, the penalty in the semi final, but then you you scored a hat trick against Spartans. Did you, could you foresee yourself scoring at Hamden for the final? 
I suppose subconsciously, when, when, when you're playing well as a player, you don't really give things too much thought. You know, I suppose it's that old one with some strikers, the dangerous thing you give somebody's time because you get time to think about things, you know what I mean? So uh, I might fall into that category a little bit, but uh, I was never, I, I just felt, give a, give, as long as I get a chance, I feel as if I'm going to score. And to be honest with you, I think that was the only shot I had the whole game. The one I scored against uh, in the semi final, sorry, the final. And, uh, but yeah, we played Motherwell, I think. Uh, there was, I don't know if that was after the final. We played Motherwell at uh, Firth Park. And again, it was a real scrappy game. And I got one chance and stuck it away. And Stuart Lovell was speaking to one of the Motherwell players and says, Doesn't matter where the ball falls to him just now. If he hits it, it's going, it's going in. Just one of those veins of uh, form. So it was uh, when, you, when you get veins of form like that, you know, they're nice because you really, you just, as soon as the ball lands it, you just stick it away. You don't even think about it. And did you see the biggest balloon in the world out there, by the way, in the lead up to your goal? <laughs> That's right. It was on. A, you look back at the commentary, and I can always mind the guy, uh, the commentator, saying, "That's the biggest football I think I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> this huge, big ball thing, <laughs> blown about on the pitch." And even see when you look back at the footage, when you see my goal, I mean, I think Lee Mako crossed the ball to Bottom of Brian. He's in the penalty box. There's nobody anywhere near him. And, uh, and then the ball gets cut back to me, and there's nobody near me. I think it's just so weird. Uh, but yeah, I do remember that football, eh? Right. Thomas, have you got anything? You, you kind of answered my question earlier. So I, I was uh, watching the, the highlights back earlier of the semi final. And, you know, I thought the, the penalty was a little bit soft. You know, I think, I think we were maybe a little bit lucky <laughs> to get that penalty. So. You know, talk to me. You've called it a Stonewall penalty already. Like, I think, in, especially in VAR days, you know, I, I think we're struggling to get that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. I, to be honest, I think when you tackle somebody from behind, because I can't remember who it was a defender that tackled Pasquinelli, was it just you're, you're taking a real chance, especially in the penalty box, you know what I mean? And Pasquinelli, he went down like a sack of spuds, you know, really, you know, he didn't need much encouragement <laughs> to get down. He was a South American. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as far as I look at, but to be fair to the referee there was no hesitation straight to the spot Brent Sancho that's who it was I know it's that stonewaller you're talking on was it Brent, Brent Sancho, Sancho? Ah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, he did so, I mean just, <laughs> it, it was one of these it was one of these stupid tackles he didn't need to make it you know I think Fernando was going away from goal it, was, you know, it wasn't exa- and he was on his right foot so it, he would have been doing well to hit the corner flag anyway on his right foot. So, uh, you know, he didn't need to make the tackle and he did and it slipped. You know, the referee just called it right away. I think you've convinced me. I think you've convinced me. So definitely a penalty then. I'm, I'm sold. I'm sold. You, you, you can't change history, Tom. Exactly. Exactly. Don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. No. Uh, Owen, what about yourself? Have you got anything? My main question is about the was about the penalty itself. Um, surprisingly enough, I remember more about the semi final and more about that goal, the, the the penalty goal. Despite the fact I never even watched you take the penalty, I was that nervous about <laughs> <laughs> about about being in a semi final. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you when you were stepping up to the penalty, did you know exactly where you were putting it? Um, and really what was kind of going through your, your head at the time, because you've got Easter Road, you've got the whole Livingston crowd in front of you as well, which which I can imagine only puts even more pressure on you as well. Was it just zone in, you know exactly where you're going, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, in any of the penalties I've ever taken, I mean, thankfully over my whole career, I've maybe taken about, I don't know, 25 to 30 penalties. And I've only missed one against Dundee uh, when I was at Morton. Uh, Billy, Billy Thompson said that. But I've, I've never missed a target. And that was, that's the key. It's just, you know, one of the one of the main thoughts of it is in, especially taking this penalty in the semi-final, whatever you do, do not miss the target. You know, uh, if you're going to hit it somewhere in the goal, you know, if the keeper saves it, he saves it. But, you know, the last thing you want to do is miss the target. So that was always in my head. But... I was always pretty confident. I was, it's a classic one. Pick a spot and hit it, and hit it, hit it well, hit it relatively firm. You know, I I, I don't say I, I probably never struck a ball cleanly as in you know like a, dri- a driven pass or like that. And I've always had a really firm side foot just for more control. So, but I had picked my spot. I was going top 
I was going top right, maybe not, maybe not as high and as right as I wanted, but <laughs> uh, it was good. <laughs> That's I sort of picked my spot. So uh, yeah, I was, I was just pretty calm, you know. I thought, right, it was a bit of a commotion. I know they're sort of protesting against the penalty. It, it, it seemed to take a bit of time just to calm down and obviously get Levy fans behind the goal. But first thought, you know, is don't miss the target. Second thought is right, I'm picking my spot, and I made my mind up, and yeah, just. Didn't take a fast run up, just my normal, you know, up, a nice firm hit, you know, and it was it was a really good penalty, thankfully. But yeah, it was I was relatively calm, you know. I, I thought I, I generally thought there was longer left in the game. I thought I think I thought it was 15, 20 minutes left, but it was only about five or six minutes. So if maybe if I'd known that, that would have you know maybe played a little bit of a part. But thankfully, I didn't. I wasn't really looking at it, and I just thought I like, just. You know, I was confident I was going to score anyway. So uh, that's all that stuff. You just you just kind of go into a bit of autopilot if you're used to taking penalties. You've got your process. Just block everything out and hit the target, and, and hopefully it goes in. So after the semi final, obviously won that and set up the infamous final with Hibs on the 14th of March. Uh, what can you tell us about the build up to such a momentous occasion for such a daft wee team? Because like. Livingston, because it's a new town, or what was the build-up like for a team like Livingston? I think it was, you know, we used to train at the, obviously, you know, the, the old Ash stuff pitch at the back of the, the training, uh, the stadium we used to train at all the time. And every now and again, you would get sort of, I mean, I didn't realise it, but at the time, sort of the, the schools in Livingston would finish a bit earlier on certain days. And you would sometimes get some parents coming around and bringing their kids around. And I always remember you would get, there was a few more people sort of coming, you know, watching these training and stuff like that. So you had that, obviously, part of the build-up. In terms of the town, I think, I know they've done a lot of promotions, I think, to the schools, you know, in terms of getting kids to the final and all that. So... I don't, I don't remember, I don't think I've sort of played a part in that. I think it was more done commercially by the club because, to be honest with you, because of the cup games, that we, we had a lot of games. Uh, so we're just constantly playing football. Mm. But there was just, it was, it was kind of funny. I mean, obviously there was a great bit of hype about the club. I mean, Livingston being a new town, I think they were really just trying to get as many people involved from the community as possible. So the, the PR was great for the club. You know, there was a lot of press, media stuff going on, interviews and all that. Uh, really, really good. You know, I think when you see the turnout, given what the average crowd was versus the turnout at the final, you know, sort of doubled the sort of, you know, there was about 8,000 fans turned up. So the, the, the club done a good job. So it was really a big PR thing, but great, great bit of excitement. You know, it's not just the week before the game. You get a slow build up, you know, the week or two before it and then the week of the cup final. Uh, you know, it just gets ramped right up, you know, and everybody's wanting to do an interview with you and try to get a different story and people's stories and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, a lot of your time gets taken up, so you're having to deal with that as a player. You don't just normally come in, go to train and get your lunch and drive home again. You're sort of having to do a lot of media stuff, so uh, you've just got to get your head around that and, and try not to say the wrong thing to the media. Give them a headline. <laughs> I mean, in terms, like you mentioned, the fans, like our sort of average attendance that season was probably about three to 4,000. There was obviously a massive thing made about how Hibs were taking 40,000 and we were only taking seven and a half, eight thousand, like see when you were walking out and you just seen, like, because the tunnel obviously you would have been right in front of just a sea of green and white and then a wee whimper in the corner from seven thousand Levy fans like, what was that sort of feeling like, like knowing that this stadium was properly dominated by the opposition? We, th- we thought it was brilliant, you know because if you could imagine if, if, if it had been a Livingston Dundee final, probably at Hamden at the bit of an anti climax, you know, just in terms of the people there. But the fact you had Hibs taking such a big crowd with them, you know, you're walking out to a near enough full Hamden, you know, it was brilliant, you know, and obviously we had the section of the Levy fans, you know, which, to be honest with you, it was just like pandemonium. You just seen a sea of gold and yellow and black, and it was just like everybody jumping about, mm. and it was just brilliant, you know, to think that. You know, first major cup final for, for a team at Livingston, you know, and, a, and against a club like Hibs who've got a huge amount of history, played in Europe, you know what I mean, and all this sort of thing. And not only that, I had a team littered with young stars who, you know, probably thought they were going to win the game. And for us, <laughs> we we never thought for a minute we were going to lose to Hibs because we'd already beaten them twice that season. So, you know, we had a mindset that we were mm. going to win the game. Uh, and, 
you know, and and we did. So it was it was, but the occasion of walking out and seeing the Habs fans there that that helped make the day in terms of it really bring it. I mean, it really like, from looking on from a television perspective as well, it made it look like a cup final, which was was brilliant. So you just want to walk out as a yeah. kid. You want to walk out in a full hand, and that's that's a dream. Walk out in a final, full hand, and you know, and you know, and that's what it was. Near enough full, so it, it was great. Really, you know, you know, did I shed a tear when I seen all these Hibs fans going back to Edinburgh on the same road as the Livingston fans? No, I didn't. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we'll open up again um, about like for questions about the final itself. Owen, have you got anything? This is one of the most bizarre questions I think about the final because it's not necessarily about the game. But Kenny Dalgleish was in the studio doing the doing the TV. Now, obviously, Kenny Dalgleish being an, an absolute icon, especially for Scottish strikers. Did you get to meet him after the game? Uh, the, 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 you know, did he sort of? Did you get any congratulations from uh, from King Kenny himself? We didn't. We didn't even know who was commentating on the game. We, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even know. Didn't even know. Uh, you know, it was just. Uh, we, we didn't have. We didn't have a clue who was commentating on the game. We knew it was going to be covered by TV. It was Channel Five, I think, had done it. Uh, and I, you know, I was very uh, yeah. fortunate uh, because I did meet I, I did I did meet Kenny Douglish years before that. When I was at Morton, I was about seventeen or eighteen, and Kenny Douglish was a Blackburn manager and they invited me, me and another player down, uh, a defender, Dougie Johnson, for a week's trial. Uh, and at that time, I think Alan Shearer he'd done his cruise ship, He was out for a year, so I went down and trained for a week. And actually, bizarrely, Lee Makel was at Blackburn. I always remember Makes being at Blackburn, so he was there at that time. And uh, I, had a, I had a week's trial. It was amazing, you know, just seeing some of the, the, the players that were there. You know, old there was an American guy, Roy Weggerly, kind of funny name, but Mike Newell was there as a striker. Uh, some really good. So Kenny the police was the manager, and and one thing that always sticks out in my mind, we're doing a bit of a sort of training session. I was training with the first team, just done as a game of football, uh, and I was about to make a run into the the sort of penalty area. Of, you know, somebody's running, and, and Kenny the police just standing beside me says, "Just don't run yet, don't run yet. Just hold your run, hold your run. Right on you go." And so he could see everything happening as an experienced player manager, and I'm I'm just a young energetic kid running about, but. But his experience, you know, sort of just and that will never leave me. You just think, wow, well, just he could see the game, and that only comes through time and experience, you know. Thomas, you got anything? Yeah, so um, obviously we've we've mentioned David Fernandez before. So you obviously started up front with uh, David that day. You know, he, David's an icon, but I I, I want to know what it was like to to play alongside you know a player of his quality. I mean, we all seen, we all love him, you know, and and. Just much we love all that team, um, couldn't yourself. So, what what was it like to play alongside a player like him? Yeah, I mean it's it's a privilege. It really is a privilege. You know, you don't get to play alongside players like that very often. I mean, I went down to Leeds and they'd full of superstars. You know, I tried my best. Maybe wasn't quite good enough. Whatever whatever happened, happened. I never, you know, it was Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. I played a little bit with them. But to actually play a season with somebody as of David's quality is a privilege. I was fortunate enough to play with Charlie Miller at Dundee United, similar sort of player uh, to David. You know, that sort of really kind of a bit of magic and win a game out of nothing. That, but David was a privilege. You know, it really was such a nice guy. I think I didn't. I'd never known David sort of before that. Uh, I think you could just get a sense that Livingston was sort of his team because he'd obviously left and went to Celtic. And to go to a big club like Celtic, it's not about your ability as well. You need to deal with everything. And David did a real bad run of injuries and all that. But you could see when he came back to Livingston how much happier he was. You know, I think he, you know, everybody just accepted the man. It was just David that was back. And we all know he's, 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 he's daft as a box of frogs. We all know what he's like. You know what I mean? He walks into training in the morning, looks like he's just fell out of bed. But yeah, he'll be the best guy in training. You know what I mean? He's just that's who he is. You know, you, you can't get the ball off him. You know what I mean? He's just and and for me, he's like a magnet. He just draws players to him. So you know, if David's on the ball, there's two or three defenders getting attracted to him because he keeps the ball so well, and and because of that, it creates time and space for other players. So you know, I get the benefit. It was that old 
two striker combination who are so different from each other. I mean, for me, it was all about getting the ball over the top, running in behind, you know, just chase, 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 energy, energy, energy. And David was all about coming short, getting the ball, just drifting into positions that players didn't want to go into and, you know, and just taking players with them. And so, great. I mean, what a nice guy. Lovely family as well from his wife. I think it's Judy, his wife was, and really nice kids and all that. So, behind the scenes, a gem of a guy, but on the pitch, an absolute privilege to play with him. Uh, Povey, have you got anything? Oh, I did a wee bit of homework. was looking through some old programmes, right? Uh, yeah, reading through this programme, I, I noticed uh, an interview with you. This is uh, Partick Thistle in May 2004. And you said in this in an interview that it still hadn't sunk in about the winning the cup. So when did it sink in? Do you know it probably it probably sunk in? I'm not saying at the end of the season, but as the season rolled on, you know, because we actually we had to play Aberdeen in a cup game. I think on the Wednesday after the cup final. So you know, and we went up. To, I think we went up to Petardry. So we had a few drinks after the game, but there was, there was so many games. Going on at the time, he did it. It's not as if we'd have felt we didn't really have a big party to celebrate. Uh, it just sort of we had, we had a party after it, but it probably took you know a good number of weeks before you start. And even now, you know, you look back now and it's you look at the enormity of what you've done and you think, wow, you know. And I, and, I, and again, I think it was uh, Alan Preston or Billy Kirkwood or something might uh, say that after the game. She's that's you in the history books, you know, created a bit of history, which you know, in football history, it's. Again, it's very, very fortunate. So it did take a number of weeks, but I think it was just due to the schedule that we had. We just didn't really get a chance as a team to you know, celebrate it as we would probably have liked to have done. You know, we probably went in a bender for about three days, but we couldn't do that. So we had a game. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, yeah, because that was the same season we reached the Scottish Cup semi final as well, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, we did. You know, because I, I think at one point as well, we were, I think, I think we were maybe on track. We were sort of whether we're going to get in the top six or something like that, you know, we're really, the season was going pretty well, you know, we're doing a lot of cup games, cup finals, you know, running the Scottish Cup, you know, and then the league games, the games were just coming thick and fast, so because of that, you're just, because we went up to play Aberdeen after that, and, you know, I was, I think I came on as a sub, but it's, we're like, we, the same players were playing every week, and we were, we were getting really burnt out, you know, we we're getting really tired, not just because of the physical games, but, Emotional drain of administration and the cup final, the sell, all, you know, all these things take mm. its toll on you. So, you know, I think after we took a wee bit of a dip, I think we, we managed to go up to Aberdeen. I don't think we won the game. I don't know if we drew it or something. I think we drew after the game, but you know, it was it was difficult. You know, just mentally draining. You know, trying to sort of get your head around things. But, uh, but yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world. Sorry, Owen. Um, David Fernandez for the second goal played what is quite possibly the greatest through ball in Scottish footballing history. And as a striker, you're looking back up the pitch because I think there was a, it was like basically kind of from a corner, a Hibs corner. So right, from yeah. a striker's corner. point of view, you're looking back up the pitch. Fernandez has played the best through ball in the world ever to your left back. How confident were you that Jamie McAllister was tucking away that, that shot? <laughs> <laughs> and it was, you're absolutely right it was such a bizarre thing because the corner came into the front post I don't know the head of the front post at the end I was at the edge of the box I hooked the ball out and it fell to David Fernandez who sort of done his little thing and dribbled a few players and, and threaded us I don't know where Jamie came from I honestly don't know <laughs> I don't know he just appeared out of nowhere but you're absolutely on, on honest I had one of the best views ever. I was honestly running right behind Jamie. So he's in front of me. And I'm a good 20 yards behind. So, uh, and I'm looking at it and I'm go- I, and I can honestly remember, I don't know what exact words going through my head. I'm just saying, oh, please score. Please, please score, you know. And when you look at his, his finish, it was the most composed finish you've ever could imagine a left back doing in a cup final. And, uh, and when that ball went in, you just thought, You'll always hear it, you know, even it's you do celebrate and you're happy, but there's a, a huge sigh of relief because you're thinking that's us two 0 up. You know, what what a margin we've got uh, you know to hold on here, what a lead. And uh, but yeah, it was bizarre, you know. I think a lot of people were saying, Who's that up there? You know, Jamie McAllister was just 
shot away. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I don't know if Jamie scored another goal that season. If he might have done, it might have been one other goal. But what a finish! You know what a finish. But bizarre set of circumstances again. Um, you know who who who'd, who'd have put money on Jamie scoring a goal in the cup final? If he did, he'd be a pretty wealthy man, I'd imagine. I think uh, <laughs> you're you're totally right. It's like who's who's that? You know, like, like you said, like McAllister's come out of nowhere. Because not even the commentator who was uh, Jonathan Pierce, the guy that commented, as far as I'm concerned, he's uh, the commentator yeah. from Robot Wars. Um, so, yeah. like, even he didn't know because he's like, it's McNamee, it's somebody. Oh, it, and then the goal goes in, and then it's only when he can see his shirt number that you're like, oh, it was McAllister. McAllister it is. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're probably lucky as well because when you mentioned Magna I mean, probably we'd, we played a three-five-two, so those guys the whole season were just bombing up and down all the time. And uh, I don't think they scored a lot of goals, but probably only two players in the pitch that could have done it would have been Jamie or David. Mm. And, uh, and thankfully, it was Jamie. And uh, aye, it was so bizarre, so bizarre. And, but I was just delighted for him, delighted for us. And uh, and I always remember a big guy, Colin Murdoch, a big hips and a half, big Irish guy at the back. Was, mm got to that 70 minute period and, and we've all watched games and you think we're never going to score and he said that to me he says we could be here all night we're not going to score you know and that was so they there was a bit of a kind of realism thinking it doesn't matter what we throw at them we're just, it's just not our day uh, so that was but when what I think it was was it Willie Young the referee I think when Willie blew yeah, the whistle yeah. Honestly, God, it's just the big, the mm. biggest sigh of relief in my life. You know, it was just like, thank, please blow the whistle. Thank God for that, because you just want to end. You know, it's just, it's, <laughs> please blow it, because there's just so much nerves. You know, but uh, it was, I, I, I some the, the the finals get so so the finals get so many different little stories going about it. It's brilliant. So the following season, you had a very very brief spell with Boston United uh, down south. Uh, before a swift return to Livingston for another fairly memorable season with the club beating the drop on the last day at the expense of Dundee. But yourself only managed three goals compared to the 18 the previous season. Was that down to just an overhaul in personnel? I mean, we lost players like Fernandez and um, obviously Andrews was away, McAllister left. So was it just something didn't click or was it down to the sort of personnel coming in and out? Oh, I, th- I think it was a lot of things. It was, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, ultimately, a, a lot changed. Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to play in the team the year before. Where, you know, you're always creating a lot of chances, and you know, as a striker, you feed off chances. And you know, if you if you get off to a good start, that helps, and you score a lot of goals. But I made a lot of changes. I mean, losing Jamie, you know, uh, was a massive blow. And I think through that season as well, we lost David McNamee. He snapped his Achilles. We lost him as well. Uh, he was out for near enough the full season. Mm. Obviously, Marvin lost. Uh, Alan Preston came in as manager and, uh, and and I had a brief spell at Boston. I mean, I was only going to Boston for the money. To be brutally honest, they were offering me you know more money than any Scottish team could ever ever afford to uh, out with the old firm. And it just wasn't the right thing. Come back, me coming back to Livingston probably wasn't right for me, but it was kind of... You know, it kind of worked out for me in terms of just, you know, I knew I made a mistake, spoke to Biscuits and Alan Preston and got, got back in, but it just, it was never the same, you know what I mean? There was there was too many changes, the team had changed, team under pressure, obviously Alan left and then the infamous Richard Goff came in. Uh, yeah, but we did, we finished the season on a, a low high point by avoiding relegation, which we did have a big party about, so uh, kind of real mixed emotions. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I enjoyed my time there and you know, I, I kind of get shafted over a contract as well because Pierce Flynn came in the new owner and a lot of boys were signing two year deals and, and uh, but actually they were trying to get rid of you after one year. It was all a bit strange at the end up, so there was quite a few boys get caught up in that, and I, I was I was one of them, but I, I, I left and went to Morton. So mixed emotions. Uh, you never want to leave a club. You know the way that, that's the only time it's ever happened to me leaving like that. You know because I always like to think that I had a good relationship with the fans because. What you see is what you got, and unfortunately, the second season, you know, I didn't score a lot of goals, mm. and, and and if you don't score as a striker, you put yourself under a lot of pressure, and if the chances aren't coming, the minute you get one, there's so much pressure on you scoring. And if you don't score, it's like, oh my god, you know. Uh, so a real tough, tough season. But as a club, we managed to scrape scrape a, 
was it a, was it a draw against Dundee in that second last game or something like that? We got a draw, did we beat them 1-0 or something like that? I mean, Richard Goff came in with Archie Knox. That was an interesting period as well, you know. Again, I first scored against Hibs that season. I won him a few goals and he just came in as a manager, but I've got no time for that guy whatsoever. You know what I mean? No respect for him whatsoever. I don't like him at all. And I don't say that about a lot of people. If I don't say that about most people. Really? You know, I didn't like him. Most, just, he was full of himself, you know, really, uh, just... Nah, not my cup of tea. Right, that's quite interesting because obviously it looked like, especially the last eight games of the season, that there was like a real sort of togetherness within the squad. But it also sort of coincided with the signing of Hassan Cashlow, yeah. who was like another sort of level of Livy icon. But what was what was it like? So what was it that sort of rubbed you up the wrong way about Richard Goff? Because from an, from an outsider looking in as a fan, it was, oh, these guys are really in for it. They're ready to fight for like, survival. But was it just personality clash? Or? Yeah, I mean, it just, it, it, obviously, I don't know if it's his first manager's job. I mean, it's that it's signed a few players. I mean, obviously, we were there and we're doing our best to, to, to sort of keep, keep things going and keep picking up points. But... You know, inevitable happens. A manager comes in. Uh, Richard Goff's the manager. And initially, I was excited. I grew up a Rangers fan. I mean, it's no secret. You know, I was really excited. But, uh, you know, it, you could just see it was all about him. You know, that's the way I seen it. It was just all about Richard Goff. All he was interested in telling stories about how he met Rod Stewart and how he's, how many millions he's got in the bank. And, and you're just thinking, what an absolute arsehole you are. You know, uh, and that's and then one of the one of the games for me that maybe not a lot of people know about and I'll share it with you was we played Alloa I think it must have been a cup game and honest to God it was just constant shouting onto the pitch about doing stuff and it was like obviously myself and other players but I was shouting back I was getting so frustrated it was just constant we sort of confronted each other in the dressing room uh, he was wanting to have a go at me and I was shouting and bawling at him and we sort of stood face to face in the Alloa dressing room and I just lost all respect for the guy you know what I mean he'd, he'd no no uh, awareness of the people he was dealing with and how people's different, how you manage people, you know what I mean? And uh, and, and Archie Knox, well-respected coach, for me he was a bit of a dinosaur, it didn't work for me either, really old school, barking orders and all that. I just thought, I had David, David Hayes would just talk to me, tell me what to do, let me get on with it and I'll do it because he trusted me. But when you get somebody come in just barking orders at you all the time, you know, I was 31, 32. I thought, I don't need to take this. You know what I mean? I'm... So, uh, and then he did apologise to me. We went, we went to a, an overnight stay in, up in St Andrews as a sort of team building thing. And uh, he did apologise to me. But I thought, nah, says I'm not having that. No chance. But in fairness to the club, I mean, they bought in Hashan Kishou and all right, he couldn't run. His legs had gone. But I'll tell you what, what a player he was. What I mean, brilliant, great ability. And we brought in two, Hi. we brought in two guys, two Austrian guys as well. Uh, I think one was a central midfielder and one was a winger. Uh, the winger was about six foot five. He's the biggest winger I've ever seen in my life, and he wasn't very good either. But the, the <laughs> other guy was all right. The midfielder. I tell, I tell I, in fact, I think there might have been three of them. There was two or three of them. <laughs> uh, uh, came in. One, there, was, there was a one that might have been a striker as well. So, but, but what happens is it becomes a season mentality anyway because um, it's, it's players who want to stay in the league. So. You're fighting for your own safety, your, your own safety, your own survival. You know, from a, a professional point of view, you want to do well and you want to stay up. So you do get a siege mentality. And if you get a couple of results, as we did, that sort of feeds it. But you don't want to get beaten and nobody wants to get relegated. So, you know, in fairness to Livingston at the club and at the time, in terms of who they brought in, it worked for it. But then he soon left after it. And, you know, I think I was glad to see the back of him. But, I mean, I left as well. But uh, it just, yeah, not for me. See, sorry, just quickly as well. So you mentioned sort of earlier on about Pierce Flynn as well. Now, there's a couple of stories I've heard about him from ex-players that like, he flew in to the stadium and landed his helicopter on the pitch and that he came in to like, the changing room at half-time or during training and stuff and told you to write down who you thought should be in the starting 11 and then started reading them out. Was he sort of difficult as like those rumours suggest? 
No, I remember, obviously a bit, a bit of noise about me, you know, anybody that's buying into a club, you're thinking, okay, they must have a few quid, you know what I mean? It's, they've got to have a few quid to get involved at some point. Didn't know anything about him. He came in, I remember, he just came into the dress room and had a bit of a chat with everybody. And uh, from what I remember as well, he never got too involved uh, in, in doing stuff. I mean, he was very much behind the scenes. Tried. There was obviously a lot of wheeling and dealing, you know, on the players and trying to bring players in, but... Uh, he did, he did come into dressing, but that was more, I think it was like after training, obviously, say, you know, he was a new chairman or whatever, as he'd done the club, but I don't remember, I don't know my time there, he, mm-hmm. did he, come, he might have done that after I was there, but because like a lot of owners, when, they, when especially when they buy into a football club, some of them want to do everything, you know what I mean, and they, they think they can do everything, but football yeah. clubs are quite unique in that, you know, if you're not, if you're not, a, if you've not been a player or a coach, you know, you can't just all of a sudden start, you know, coaching people. Uh, but uh, but it was it was a wee bit different, I suppose. Uh, you know, his approach. You know, he was, uh, came across as quite a flash guy. You know, he was actually okay. You know, he was pretty decent, and he, he had his, his kind of right hand woman, a wee woman called Vivian, uh, which everybody sort of referred to. She was like she was like a wee Rottweiler. She done all the dirty work. You know, she was the one. Uh, she, she was the one you didn't want to get involved in a conversation with. You know, she was a sort of hard nosed business person. Yeah, because it was. I, I remember, sorry, reading somewhere about Stuart Lovell that season. It's sort of fallen out with. I don't know if he fell out with the manager or if he fell out with the owner, but apparently it was. I think he ended up getting sacked or made redundant or whatever. Uh, but I think apparently it was that Vivian Kyle's that was sort of driving it. Me, like trying to find out what he was saying about the club and stuff. Do you know what I think? I, 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 now that you actually say that, I do, I'm pretty sure that something like that happened. I think that, I don't know if it became a wee bit of an agenda against uh, Stuart, you know, because obviously Stuart done probably, he done a lot of stuff in the media and that, and, uh, and, and some clubs can become very paranoid about what's been written about them. And I, I do remember vividly something to, to do with that, that Stuart became a wee bit of a target and uh, yeah, and, and he was one of the ones I left as well because I think to do with the contractual thing. I remember we all sat in a union's office with, with Fraser Wisher talking about the options and all, and I think uh, Stuart was one of them. So yeah, you know, like, obviously clubs will look at certain players and they want to weed them out or get them out, and they'll do whatever they can to get players out. You know, and that's the side of football that you know not everybody sees. You know, because that, that's the sort of crap as a player. Sometimes you've got to put up with, and uh, you've got to kind of just kind of get through if it's sometimes if the club have made their mind up they're going to get busy by one way or another they'll get you out the door uh, finally we gave you a wee bit of homework about uh, choosing your dream Livingston five-a-side team uh, made of players that you played with uh, can you tell us who they are and why so uh, so in, in goal I put Roddy so I had to be Roddy in goal yeah you know so pick, pick Roddy in goal big Roddy he was a roommate of mine uh, big Roddy so uh, I know Roddy really well so he, he would be in goal Did a, he done well at Livingston now the dilemma I did have is I think right I can't pick Jamie without picking David McNamee so what I've done is left the both of them out and went for experience so <laughs> I went <laughs> I went for Marvin as a centre half Marvin will head and kick anything that moves so he'll just, just he'll cover the whole back. He'll just lie down, Marvin. Uh, midfield, I'm going for Stuart Lovell and Lee Mackel. <laughs> Stuart's another one. Stuart will organise and shout and bark all the orders. Oh. And makes makes his brilliant, great on the ball. He'll create you the wee chances and he'll score the odd goal or two. And then I've put David Fernandez up front. If I put myself up front, you know, I had to left David out, you know, but I had to play David. So David would go in and I would I would be I would be the player manager on the bench managing him. <laughs> so I've left if you can probably see as you can probably see from the team, I've left out all the young guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but now, Lee Lee Mako, I I said this fairly recently that the year we won the cup, I thought that Lee Mako was probably the best centre or one of the best centre mids in Scotland that season because he scored about 12 or 13 goals from midfield yeah. and just everything we'd done that season either went through Fernandez or went through Makel I thought yeah it was phenomenal I mean, I mean Stuart Lovell I mean Stuart, Stuart was Stuart had bad injuries you know Stuart wasn't there he struggled to keep himself fit his knee was a bit knackered but he, he would sort of he would always battle on and he'd button up Ryan was energy but makes Lee Mako in the middle of the park was phenomenal. You know, just his range of passing, his vision, 
top notch player. You know, played at Newcastle, played at Blackburn, played a lot of good teams, Hearts for a long time. Uh, but yeah, I completely agree with you. And, uh, and I think he's he's probably all know the story about the cup final. When what a cup final he had, you know, he's somebody he knocked down somebody in the middle of Edinburgh, an old drunk tramp that broke mm. his leg. And he was staying overnight before the game. Stuart Lovell, his roommate, he gets called away. His father-in-law passes away, takes a heart attack. Nobody's expecting him to turn up at the game. We're all in the dressing room. And who comes walking in? Lee Mako, you know. And, and he crossed the ball over to Button for set up for Mago. But you know what I mean? What a story he had that season. But you're right. You know, you know he must have been one of the top midfielders out with Old Firm. You know that season uh, without shadow of it. Never scored a bad goal either. Every goal was amazing. Oh, him. everyone was like twenty-five yards top bin and all that. <laughs> you know, he never scored a tap and they were, they were left him. They were all left to me. <laughs> But uh, let's let's not. Let, I mean, I, I totally agree. With, I think Mako's brilliant, but I do have these faint memories when he hit a shot. The amount of times it would fly over the bar, like. No, I was just going to say in that two-one uh, game uh, that the, uh, was the, uh, our first season in the SPL. There was uh, uh, the game where we beat Rangers two-one. Um, I think we had just gone two-one up. And Lee Mako gets on the ball, gets passed back to him. I mean, like, there's nothing in the way whatsoever. And it's it's a proper, like, <laughs> like he's just, he's hit it sweetly. But it's just gone. I think I think it's still, I think it's probably lodged somewhere above the shopping centre in Livingston. <laughs> still, <laughs> still, still, still at the games. <laughs> and his defence, I was going to say, Jake, that, uh, the one thing his defence is, Almond Vale's not a very high stadium, so it's quite easy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. No, I admit it, I admit it. No, but, you know, he's one of these guys, I, I think it's to do with it. Yeah. I think, it, this might sound really bad, I think it's the way he hits the ball, you know, as in, it's just his style, you know, he really sort of, he kind of slashes at the ball, but when he does hit it sweetly, you know, it's a real sweet strike, but when it's done soft by a couple right. percent, because he's got a really kind of unusual stance, the way he kind of very distinctive the way he struck the ball, you know, but uh, I can see what you mean with the whole kind of slicers. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just one last thing before we finish up as well. Uh, you came back for Keegan Jacobs' testimonial. Uh, what was that like, sort of coming back to the club? And obviously it was a completely different you sort of look at Livingston as sort of different sort of mini clubs we're a sort of completely different team to what we were back then in terms of the money we've got and the, even the pitch we've got now but what was it like coming back and sort of seeing the, the Livingston supporters again? Oh, it was really nice it was, it was lovely because you know when you've when you've been at a club, uh, I'm very fortunate to be at a few clubs where you know they've got fond memories of me, you know, and, and and to feel appreciated, you know, and you know you leave football. I've been away from football a long time, but to go back and you know and fans, you know, give you a round of applause and just show their appreciation and you know realise that you know that what you've done for them as a club at that period of time, you're there and they appreciate it. You know, it's, it's nice. It's very humbling. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, we all grow up. Nobody. You know, we all want to play football as kids, you know, you never know when you're going to get there, but you know, to, to get yourself out of a football pitch and spend a lot of time on it's brilliant. But to go back when you've you know, for after a long period of time the fans to appreciate you the way they did, you know, albeit my forty five minutes I was absolutely blown out my arse, but it was uh, it was good. <laughs> it was good uh, it was nice to see them, you know, it was, it was nice to catch up with all the old players as well, you know, Max and Archie and and uh, Big Marvin and uh, and obviously Roddy and that as well, you know. Uh, so it was, it was nice, nice occasion to get back. Really enjoyed it. So the last and probably one of the most important questions, I suppose, that we can ask you today is going to be uh, if you could give us a prediction for this weekend's cup semi final against St Mirren. What's it going to be? Well, given I'm an ex-Morton player, I'm always going to say, and I'm a Livy player. Livy's going to win. I'm saying three 0 That's perfect. Well. Uh, just want to say on behalf of everyone here, um, as well as probably every Livingston supporter, thanks so much for your time, and you'll be welcome back to Club Earth anytime. Right, guys. Enjoy the fight. Enjoy the semi-final. Let's hope we get the final. Thanks very much, okay? With the League Cup, 
semi-final against St Mirren at Hamden, fast approaching. We're going to reminisce about some of the great semi-final moments that the Lions have had over the years. Uh, so, boys, the semi-finals that we've appeared in are the following. Uh, 2-1 win against East Stirling in the Challenge Cup 2000-2001. That same season, we were defeated 3-0 by Hibs at Hamden Park in the Scottish Cup semi. There was obviously the amazing semi-final against Dundee in 0304 in the CIS Cup at Easter Road. Uh, that same season, we were dumped out at the semi-final stage in the Scottish Cup by Celtic, 3-1 at Hamden. The Paul Lambert era, 2005-6, we reached the semi-final and got put out by Dunfermline, again at Easter Road. The Challenge Cup 2014-15 season, where we beat Stranraer uh, in penalties at the Tony Mac Arena. And finally, the Dundee United playoff in the first leg obviously finished 3-2 to Livingston at Tannadice, and then the second leg at Ammonville finished 1-1. So, Thomas, let's hear your favourite semi-final moment. So I'm going to touch on, you know, one of my favourite games over the last few years to go to uh, at home. I was I was unfortunate enough not to go to the, uh, the first leg of the, the playoff run uh, against Dundee, but... The, the game at home, the the one the one one draw was, um, you know, as far as semi finals go, that was just fantastic. I think um, it was a lovely day uh, out. We'd been at the pub, absolutely fantastic. Walked down, struggled to get into the stadium. A uh, big group of us managed to get into the south stand for the first time in years, which was you know something quite special as well. Being in there, it brought back a lot of memories of being younger. Um, and then just as I, you know, was walking across the back of the goal, uh, seeing Alan Lithgow score that goal, uh, and, and I think I screamed, and I, be, I really, I really uh, gave a fright to the boy that was walking in front of me, and I had to apologise to him. Well, my semi-final moment will be the. Uh, I'm going to choose the first leg of the playoff uh, semi-final against Dundee United, three-two. Um, the reason why I'm choosing that is because uh, for me it's very memorable because I haven't been able to make it to many Livy games over the last few years because of um, work. Um, and on that particular night, I wasn't at that game in particular, but I was on. I was in a pub in Sky um, working. I wasn't working in the pub, but I was working up in Sky. And uh, being able to watch the game, uh, I think I walked in just slightly after kickoff and we were already 1-0 up, and I had no idea. The game was just being shown on the telly, and I had no idea that we'd, that we'd even scored at all. Um, and I wasn't expecting um, to have scored either. Um, and then, obviously, then I sit down, have my dinner, and I'm like, yes, brilliant, okay, we're 1-0 up. And then, of course, they equalise, and then they go 2-1 up. Um, but then just when that second half started, the, the, the second half is, is, is just it's full of great moments. Uh, Josh, Josh Mullins goal, first of all, and then Scott Pittman, that's just nutmegging or taking the ball past, uh, Belial Moshni and firing it into the back of the net and just the, um, the, a very rare occasion for emotion to be shown from, uh, from Mr. Pittman himself. Um, never sort of normally shows much emotion, but that the, the you know proper fist pump and the big come on to the crowd and stuff, and just the pandemonium that you can see in the stands, uh, and then of course we Gollum, uh, uh, Willow Flood getting sent off, and the whole debacle that followed that was just it was it was just an epic epic game. Um, I mean, obviously those other semi finals. I was at the Dundee um, the Dundee semi final uh, in the CIS Cup winning season. I was at that game. Um, I don't really remember very much about it. Um, I, I, I even said in the interview with Derek Lilly that I wasn't even looking at Derek Lilly taking the penalty because I was, I, I just, I was so nervous. Um, so in terms of really remembering, and it was wasn't really a memorable game aside from the aside from the penalty and the fact we won it. Um, but for me, Dundee United semi final, both both legs were brilliant. But um, I think that. That performance just epitomised everything about Livingston from that League One going into the Championship and then getting promoted to the Premiership. It just that three-two performance was just it was just fantastic. It was just a great performance. The resilience that we shown to uh, to get ourselves um, come from behind again to get ourselves in front. 
to eventually. Uh, well, we all know where the story ends, really. I I was I would probably choose the Dundee United first leg. It was my favourite moment as well. But again, I wasn't there. I, me and Hannah had just gotten engaged, so I took her up for a romantic weekend to Aberdeen, of all places. <laughs> and uh, I remember when we sort of arranged, like we put the travel up to Aberdeen and that, and I was like, right, everything should be fine. Uh, nothing is going to come up, surely. So we had an engagement party on the Saturday, and then I was like, fuck, love your playing on the Monday. So it was, a, was that a Sunday or a Monday? I think it was a Monday night, and uh, I was like, oh no, I'm in Aberdeen. So I remember like trying to guilt trip her at one point, saying like, oh, Oh, I've just off the phone to my dad, like, he's going to Dundee by himself, like, oh, I feel quite bad just leaving him, eh? Like, oh, nah, that's quite harsh. And then I actually found out that my dad actually wasn't going. Uh, so, but we managed to find a pub in Aberdeen, shown it. Uh, and I was, we ordered food and stuff, food came to the table, just as kick-off uh, happened. And then obviously, De Vita scored in the first, like, 30 seconds. But, I didn't cheer. The the way I celebrated was nothing more of embarrassing that I just leapt out my chair and went <laughs> like that was just slightly louder than that um, but basically it was only me and Hannah in this pub and the woman who was serving us was like through the back and she came rushing out with like a first aid kit thinking that someone had like fallen or like <laughs> broke their leg or something. <laughs> so, so, and then obviously the, uh, I think the next, well, obviously we went 2 1 down and I was like, I was just in a raging huff. And then when we got the back, they came back to 2 2 and 3 2. I think I managed to celebrate more appropriately those times. But I, I just remember that's the build up to those games and, the, the second leg as well as Thomas said like being in the south stand and like I think the the second leg I knew we were getting promoted I thought if it was going to be a team to knock us out it would be the team in the championship but then when I knew when we found out that we were playing Partick I was like nah we'll demolish them until they scored in the first leg in the first like 10 minutes and then I was like oh no Livy never do anything good I hate Livy I kind of heard you actually say that in my ear when that first goal went in so I concur <laughs> trust, trust the Ennis brothers yeah. to be out for dinner in that game both of you is like <laughs> well, I'll actually even tell you this so the, the, for the for the semi the semi-final first leg I was in a pub in Sky. Uh, to watch it and then for the first leg of the final against Partick Thistle you'll never guess where I was same pub in the same pub watching nice. us again so it was it was almost like it was it, it was meant to be I, I think if, had I not been working in Sky on those two uh, for those two games I don't think we would have got promoted had I went we never it never would have happened like, break, break the <laughs> rules and go up on Sunday from the run game <laughs> it's worth it <laughs> um stuff so, I mean, the other semi-finals, uh, there was a couple I was at. I remember being at the Dunfermline one at Easter Road that we lost and it being genuinely one of the worst games I've ever been to. Uh, and then, but on the flip side of that, two seasons before the Dundee one with Derek Lilly's penalty, which we'll come on to later, obviously speaking to him. Um, but, I mean, looking back at the results, we've had a fair... Fair amount of success in semi-finals, not a hundred percent record, but nah. I think uh, the ones that we've been in and that we've won have always been in memorable circumstances. Well, that just about wraps it up for this first episode. Before we go, though, we're recording this before the midweek game against Celtic at the Macarena, so we won't be doing a predictions for that, but we're going to quickly go round the table for predictions for the semi-final. Liam, what do you think? I don't know. Honestly, it's one of these things that I think it might actually depend on 
the Celtic game. I think if we if we beat Celtic, I reckon we'll lose the semi final. Because <laughs> I, I I know that sounds so pessimistic. That's my very livy. My pessimistic head is saying one 0 to St Mirren. But my heart's saying six 0 to Livy. Aaron Taylor Sinclair. <laughs> Patrick. Okay, uh, Thomas, what do you think? I'm going to say 2 0, Livy. Uh, I think maybe a, a goal in the first half, um, and then, you know, maybe a, a sub making a difference in the second half to seal the game. Maybe a, a Jack Hamilton uh, to, to make it 2 0. But I'm, 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 well, not confident, but, you know, going with my heart. So 2 0, Livy. Good man. Owen, you? I. In a way, I agree with Liam. I think it depends on what's going to happen uh, against Celtic. I, I, obviously, we're playing against Celtic. The le- is the league the more um, the thing that we're focusing on more this season? Or I mean, it'd be great to reach um, a final, uh, especially with the teams that are left in. Um, but I, I think we've not seen a lot of games this season where both teams haven't scored. We've kept a few clean sheets, mind you. I'm going to say it's going to be 2-1 either way. Um, obviously, I want it to be 2-1 Livingston, and I would love to see Gavin Riley come on from the bench. <laughs> Our sponsored player, Gavin yes. Riley, come in off the bench and uh, and score to, to put it right up his former team. Uh, so that's... Uh, I'm going to go 2-1 Livy, uh, but I don't think we're going to keep a clean sheet in this one. Mm-hmm. Fair. Uh, I think I'm going to be really boring and I'm going to think 1-0 Livy and Scotty Pittman, just a wee, a wee touch or something, just, you know, talking maybe like 60 minutes or something. Nothing too exciting, I reckon, super scrappy game. Um, but aye, a W for Livy in the end, for sure. Okay, that wraps everything up nicely. Thanks to everyone for listening. Next week, we'll be joined by former striker Colin McMenamin for another exclusive interview. Please make sure you give us a follow on Facebook. Just search for the Almond View podcast and follow us on Instagram and Twitter where our at is just at Almond View pod, all one word. That's at Almond View pod. Forza Olivia, hope to see you next week.